Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. In July of 1903, the Bohemian Austrian poet, Rainer Maria Rilke, exhausted and sick, left Paris and headed to the Northern Plain in Germany to regain his strength. He arrived to reign and hunkered down. After 10 days, the clouds lifted, and we can imagine so did his spirits. It is then that he wrote a letter to Franz Xaver Kapus, a 19-year-old Austrian cadet and aspiring writer with whom he had been in correspondence. This was his fourth letter in the collection that became famously Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet. I commend to you their entire correspondence, but the fourth letter contains my favorite passage. Here is just a little of it. In the great silence of these distances, I am touched by your anxiety about life. Here where I am surrounded by an enormous landscape, which the winds move across as they come from the seas, here I feel that there is no one anywhere who can answer for you these questions, which in their depths have a life of their own. But even so, I think that you will not have to remain without a solution if you trust in things that are like the ones my eyes are now resting on. If you trust in nature, in the small things that hardly anyone sees and that can so suddenly become large, immeasurable. If you have this love for what is humble, then everything will become easier for you, more coherent and somehow more reconciling. I want to beg of you to be patient with everything unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves, as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers now, which cannot be given to you, because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far into the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into an answer. Perhaps you do carry within you the possibility of creating and forming an especially blessed and pure way of living. Train yourself for that. But take whatever comes with great trust. Live the questions now. The truth is, we never really know what's next. The old Yiddish proverb says, we plan, God laughs. But we pretend to know what's next. We keep calendars, though we probably don't think of that as an act of faith. It's tremendously destabilizing to try to wrap our minds around not knowing. For those of you who are inveterate planners, it must be especially upsetting. But the spiritual practice of living the questions, living the questions, is exactly what this moment calls for. This moment in which, more than most, we have absolutely no idea what comes next. I was supposed to be on vacation earlier this month, and one night over dinner, our pod actually started playing with the idea of reuniting in Florida for a few days. 
Yes, there were flights, very affordable flights. Yes, there were loads of choices of accommodations. It all seemed like a great idea, a great idea until Mo called his friend, a doc in the infectious disease department at Children's Hospital. Are you out of your minds, his friend asked. The COVID variants are about to hit the East Coast. We have no idea if the vaccines will hold. This is actually the worst idea you've ever had. Chastened, we changed our minds. The temptation is strong to go somewhat histrionic. Will we ever be able to travel again? And that line of questioning inevitably gives way to so many, will we ever be able to, questions. The answer is, we don't know. We don't know anything. We just have to live them. Live the questions now. Years ago, Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh instructed his students, please calligraph the sentence, are you sure, on a piece of paper and tape it to your wall. This is another way of coming at the truth of not knowing. Even when we think we know, are we sure? American Tibetan Buddhist nun Pema Chidron elaborates, when we think that something is going to bring us pleasure or give us misery, we don't know what's really going to happen. We try to do what we think is going to help, but we don't know. We never know if we're going to fall flat or stand up tall. When there's a big disappointment, we don't know if that's the end of the story. It may be just the beginning of a great adventure. Life is like that. We call something bad, we call it good, but really, we just don't know. In Buddhism, don't know mind is the mind free of ideas and opinions. It's considered a very high state of consciousness. Students are continually exhorted to practice with don't know mind. I find this especially useful when the road gets rough. When we find ourselves telling ourselves stories about what we're experiencing that may and may not be true. Buddhist student Mark Lesser tells a story of living at Green Gulch Farm, a Zen retreat center in California. A sliding wooden door at the entrance of the student living quarters was regularly being left open, and it was a big problem. The cold Pacific Ocean winds would sweep in and chill the whole area. Announcements were made again and again at community work meetings, reminding people to close the door behind them. But it continued to be left open. And over time, it became an issue that began to divide the community. People grew emotional. Fingers were pointed in blame. And then in the midst of a particularly tense meeting, Sierra, the farm's resident golden retriever, opened the door, letting herself in to join the group. Sierra did not close the door behind herself. There was a stunned silence, and then there was an eruption of laughter. No one had known that she had figured out how to open the sliding wooden door. False assumptions had led to perilously bad feelings. Please calligraph the sentence, are you sure, on a piece of paper, and tape it to your wall. Live the questions now. In the early 1990s, there was a popular dialogue group exercise in which the conversation consisted entirely of questions. The topics were free ranging, but you weren't allowed to make statements. It was a little frustrating, or very frustrating, but the line of questioning, and it was all one long line of questioning, was driven very deep, very fast. You were encouraged to take notes for discussion later. And one of the first things all of us noticed was all the ways we asked questions. 
there were statements masquerading as questions, rhetorical questions, open-ended questions, strategic questions, questions that modify, overlap, or point to another question. The authors at the nonprofit Co-Intelligence Institute write, when we live the questions in our conversations, we are in dialogue with the people around us. When we live the questions as a way of life, we are in dialogue with life itself. These pandemic times have been a lot about what we can and cannot control with the answer thudding down heavily on the side of cannot. Parker Palmer, educator and founder of the Center for Courage and Renewal, recounts a story from Baptist minister and professor Reverend Dr. Gregory C. Ellison II, whom he calls my mentor, who's half my age. He says, Greg Ellison's grandmother taught him that while he can't change the whole world, he can change what's within three feet or so. And we can do that at every moment. Greg hands people at his workshops a tape measure, a one yard tape measure. And he says, just carry this with you. And at any given moment, stretch it out, either literally or in your imagination. See what you might change for the better for the people you're with, the situation you're in. Parker says, that goes in my journal of small successes. When I can do that a few times a day, oh, I hit the three-foot mark, and that's good. He continues, I like the David Wagner poem when he says, stand still. You are not lost. You may think you're lost, but this forest knows where you are. Listen for guidance. Here's the poem, it's called Lost. Stand still. The trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here and you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen, it answers, I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Parker Palmer has shared extensively about a deep depression he experienced and the lessons it surfaced. One of my favorite lessons came from his therapist. After Parker had revealed some things that he found the most devastating about who he had come to understand himself to be, a secular confession, Parker says, his therapist, who had been listening carefully, gazed at him with genuine kindness in his eyes. He said, welcome to the human race. Parker Palmer says, it was a moment in which I realized a couple of things. Nothing shocks this guy because he's seen it all. So I'm not nearly as special as I thought I was, even in my shadow. And this is a part of the human condition, to feel confused, to feel lost, to feel there's nothing I can do. And as long as we cling to those feelings, we'll be confused and lost and empty-handed. But as soon as we can say, that just comes with the territory of being human. Welcome to the human race. Then we begin to be liberated from those paralyzing emotions. 
And there are things we can do, many things within three feet or so, or maybe more. Your radius expands as you walk this walk with the help of other people. Welcome to the human race. Please calligraph the sentence, are you sure, on a piece of paper and tape it to your wall. Live the questions now. Krista Tippett, creator of the On Being Project, says, I've thought a lot over the years how we really love this idea of beginnings, middles, and endings, and we tell stories that way. But in the story of real life, the endings are always beginnings. And what feel like endings are middles. Then here we are in this moment, which also happens to be in the true life story when something transpires that completely upends our plans and becomes not just a transition, but a threshold. Speaking of the pandemic, she continues, one of the things that's so stressful about this transition, this threshold, is that we don't know what we're moving towards. We never knew in the days and weeks when this was imminently upon us, we didn't know that everything we had planned up to then was going to shift utterly and that just the ordinary ways we structured our days and our life and our sense of time and space were going to be disrupted. She continues, I think it's clear to all of us. There's so much that's coming out of this that's not going to be the same. I always cite my friend, the Reverend Jen Bailey, for reminding me that in the original Greek, the word apocalypse doesn't mean the catastrophe. It means the uncovering. This virus, this crisis, is uncovering a lot of things. It's uncovering kindness and generosity. It's uncovering things we didn't know we knew how to do, like be quiet and stay at home. It's uncovering our physical frailty. We've had so many devices to convince ourselves that that's not as true as it is. And it's uncovered all these flaws and holes in the web of our relationships to each other and how we haven't structured our society around that. So here we are, Krista Tippett concludes, in a communal, collective, global transition. Transitions are the hardest thing in human life. Moving is one of the most stressful life experiences. And there's a way in which right now we are all together moving from one reality to another that we can't see. And so part of the spiritual work, the calling now, is to stand respectfully before all that we cannot know. We're all in transition together. But the unknown we're moving into is something we share. To really actively accompany each other in living the questions might be a spiritual calling and also a civilizational calling for this very extraordinary transition. Apocalypse means the uncovering. Welcome to the human race. Please calligraph the sentence, are you sure, on a piece of paper and tape it to your wall. Live the questions now. Beloved spiritual companions, let's close as we began with Rilke. I want to beg of you as well as I can to be patient with everything unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers now. 
which cannot be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Let us take whatever comes with great trust and live the questions now. Amen. And now, for an, our benediction, I invite you to put your hands over your heart in namaste. I bow to the divine in you. From Rainer Rilke, may we be patient with everything unresolved in our hearts and try to love the questions themselves. Let us take whatever comes with great trust and live the questions now. Let us keep this faith, beloveds, and pass it on. The service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. I love you. Amen. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. For your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your people are my people. Your divine, my divine. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.